Awesome. Um, well, first off, yeah, thanks, John, Victoria, for organizing this. I've attended a bunch of sessions, super informative and, and fun just to actually get out of the bubble of your own work environment and, and talk to people. So um, thanks, everyone, for being here for this session. What I want to talk about is what you didn't know about Retrofit with Kotlin. So my name is Rahul. I currently am at Facebook, where, of course, I do Android stuff. And then prior to working at Facebook, where, which is you know, where I've been for about four years now, I was at Pinterest. Um, and at Pinterest, I was doing both Android stuff and API stuff. And so this topic of being able to talk to uh, API service and getting data back with Retrofit, that is something that um, I definitely worked with quite a bit. So aside from you know, my day job, I also am pretty active on, on YouTube. Um, I'm not sure if I, should, if I should call myself a YouTuber, but I definitely spend a lot of time on YouTube and, and creating content. So would love to connect with you on YouTube. And I also am pretty active on Twitter and LinkedIn. So would love to connect with you and get any feedback or questions through any medium. So taking a step back, I think everyone, or most people who do Android are probably aware that you know, retrofit is a really popular way to do networking. But what does it actually mean? So if you look back um, and you think about you know, your browser, you're using Chrome or Firefox, that is essentially a client, right? And you're going to talk to some server um, through HTTP or maybe HTTPS. And these are application level protocols, which allow you to request data from a server, whether that's a computer underneath your desk or some computer in the cloud. And historically, what's happened is you know, the server will send us back a web page. You know, which is HTML markup language, which describes, okay, here's the data that you, you should render in the browser, along with the markup, which is where is the button, the paragraph tag, how to position everything, all that is embedded inside of the HTML document. And so when mobile phones came around in, you know, like 2007, 2010, like as they started getting popular, popularity, then what would happen is the server would do the same thing. You would have a mobile browser and that would send back HTML and the mobile browser would render that. But what started happening as we, as we created native applications is that we wanted to decouple the markup from the data, right? So instead of actually having the server decide, here's how we want to position elements and here are the different uh, components to render on the screen, the mobile application would decide that. The client would decide how to render that data. And instead, we wanted now some language agnostic or markup free way of sending data. And one of the most popular ways of doing that is JSON. So JSON is really simple. It's a data interchange format. And the way I think about it is that it's kind of like cryptocurrency, right? You know, the cryptocurrency craze going on now. Cryptocurrency, whether you're using dollars in your home country or rupees or pesos, it doesn't really matter. Cryptocurrency is something that everyone ideally should be able to understand, right? So the same thing applies to JSON. Whether you're using Kotlin or Java on the client, or if your server is written in Python or Ruby, um, JSON is a common language for the client and server to communicate back and forth. And then other options for you know, this data interchange format, there's a ton of them available. You have XML, you have Protobuf, um, there's a couple others. I think JSON has become really popular um, and there are different trade-offs to choosing one or the other, but I think um, JSON is super popular and all the code that I'll show you, I'm assuming JSON. Okay, so what is our objective with networking? Um, fundamentally, our Android app should be able to retrieve or send data to a web service, whether that's something that you don't own. It could be like a third-party API, like you know Twitter or Flickr, and you talk to the API, or it could be your own backend for your company, and you want to be able to um, do something with the data that that web service is returning. Uh, one of the important points I want to call out is that usually the communication that happens between client and server is through something called a RESTful API. And we won't go into the details too much of what RESTful means, but the way I think about it is that a RESTful API gives you a standardized set of HTTP methods. For example, get, post, patch, update, delete. And these are acting on resources. So endpoints represent a resource, and you can take different actions using these methods on those endpoints. And one other objective that we would like to be able to do in our Android app is whatever data we get over the wire, whatever the bytes we are, whatever JSON data or, or the bytes that we receive, we want to be able to turn that into a usable Kotlin object in our application. 
right? And so the canonical way of doing this in Kotlin is a data class. So we have a data class which has certain attributes. Um, and we would like to be able to automatically serialize and turn in turn the JSON into a data class or deserialize a data class and turn that into its component parts represented by JSON. Okay, so let's get into it. Um, we have an Android app. What I might do is create an okay HTTP client, um, which is what is actually doing the work to issue a HTTP request, right? And so I'm calling, <clears throat> I had just get blog post method. It takes in a URL, which um, you could imagine is like the base URL. I have the post ID, which is the details of which post I want to retrieve. And I return a string, right? Um, so I could have like a request builder. I pass in the URL, I call dot build, and then I call dot execute. And that this dot execute line is what's actually doing the network operation. And we're doing it synchronously here. So we get a response back. I check the body of that response. If it's non-null, then I return the, the string value. If it's null, I return null, right? Same thing happens now. I have another endpoint in my application where, where I want to get all the authors for all the blog posts in the blog that I have, right? So we're creating like a hypothetical blog application. So here we have a URL. There's no ID to specify, right? Because we're getting all the authors. The one thing that's unique here is that the URL we are ordering, um, we have a query parameter where we're ordering the authors by the number of posts. So the author who has made the most number of posts, you want that one to be first and then it goes in descending order. Same thing, we are calling dot execute, which is synchronously doing this network operation on the main thread, which we'll talk about what that means. And then we either return null or the string version of, of this URL, of this request. All right, so we feel pretty good about this, right? And I would say no, I definitely, this is not something that we would want each of our application or Android developers to be able to write. Um, networking is inherently very complicated. And what I just showed you is papering over a ton of these complexities, which I wanna talk about just briefly here. Number one is network issues, right? So you might have a 400 error, which is like a 404, and that represents a client error. That means a client is requesting something which doesn't exist in the case of a 404. But in general, 400 errors mean that the client is doing something wrong. A 500 error means that there's a server issue. So the request looks valid, but the server for whatever reason is unable to fulfill that request. And so depending on what kind of error you got, you at least want to log that on the client and maybe even show some different UI. Um, the other thing is that we definitely want to be punting work to the background thread. If you do this really expensive operation like disk IO or network IO or just doing some computationally heavy operation on the main thread, that will lead to a really poor experience, right? Because you're gonna um, not, the UI won't be responsive because the UI thread or the main thread is busy doing all this other work. And so we really should be doing that network operation on a background thread. Uh, we also, instead of returning a string data type, we would like to be able to convert the data we get back from the API into the correct user or post object. And also things like caching. So OK HTTP will have some notion of caching, but you know, for things like images or videos or even API requests, you would like to be able to configure that potentially. And all this is going to make the code we wrote really difficult to write and maintain. And so I give this one a sad fix. Um, and let me just annotate what we're doing here. So like that dot execute, that should really be happening on a background thread. Um, when we check the response dot body, that could be nullable, but there's a lot more error handling that we should be doing here. And then instead of returning the string version of the response body, we ideally would want to convert that into Kotlin data classes, right? So there's a whole host of issues that this is not how we would like to be able to write networking code on Android. And so, hey, we're all programmers here, right? So typically when you have this kind of problem where you have something really complicated going on, what you would like to be able to do is hide that complexity. So as an app developer, I don't have to be concerned about the lower le level networking code, right? And so typically the way you do this, the solution is let's use an interface. Let's create an interface to define how does our app interact with the API. And all of the complexity that we talked about will be hidden behind this uh, API implementation, this interface implementation that we don't need to be concerned about when we write our app code. And so we could imagine creating an interface that looks like this. I called it blog API. And we have two functions here, get post, which takes in a post ID, 
and get authors. And you'll notice here, the return type is actually a post or a list of user, right? Which is what we want. So now whoever is calling this code, it becomes much easier. I could just, in my view model or my main activity or whatever, I could call blog API is equal to blog API impl, which is implementation of the interface. And now everything else is much more readable. And so all of the hard part of what we're doing here is now punted into the blog API impl class. And so I'm not gonna actually show you that, but you know what we could imagine is you have this blog API impl and it extends the blog API and then all the logic for creating OKHTTP, doing the type conversion, all the error handling will go inside of here. So we're happy now, right? This is definitely an improvement over what we just showed. Um, and I would say, no, we're definitely, a lot more improvement could be made here. The first issue in my mind that the code for this class that we just defined, blog API implementation is repetitive and error prone. So if you have like multiple Android apps, for example, you have to like really go in and think about what kind of network configuration do you want? How do you want to write it? And make sure that you um, don't have any issues with the er error handling or the type conversion inside of blog API impl. The second issue, which I think in some ways is actually more uh, pernicious is that we're not actually creating a clean interface between the networking layer and the app layer. So for example, a very common thing that you could imagine is that um, instead of sorting the number of authors by how many blog posts they wrote, maybe we'll sort them by how many comments that that author has received. So now what we'd have to do is instead of having um, a URL parameter, we'd have to, we, in addition to the one URL parameter that we already have for sorting the authors by number of articles, we also would add one more. And so we have to peel back the abstraction of blog API implementation and then modify the code in the implementation class to um, write the logic to embed that in the URL, right? So uh, we have to write that logic ourselves and, and maintain that mapping of the Boolean that we pass in, for example, or the enum that we pass in, and how does that translate to a query parameter? And then second, we're manually performing type conversions in this imaginary scenario, right? Um, and this also is pretty painful because almost inevitably a month from now or a couple months from now, um, we're going to have to add one more field on our user object or one more data, data attribute on our post, on our blog post object. And so in that case, we'd have to go into the blog API implementation and then manually parse out that additional field that we have, right? And so you can kind of tell very quickly that we're not doing a good job of hiding the complexity of the networking layer to the app developer. So again, I am giving this one a sad face. And so this is where Retrofit comes in. We're able to programmatically create the blog API interface. The implementation of that will be done for us by Retrofit. And that solves a whole host of problems. Um, the way Retrofit works is that we're going to leverage annotations to describe what kind of requests we're making and what kind of query parameters we're adding on to the endpoint. And so instead of having this really uh, hard to write blog API implementation, we will instead take our original interface and with retrofit, we'll write it like this, where each method will have an annotation describing what kind of request is it, a get, a post, a put, whatever, um, with a path. So here we have post slash ID, and the ID is coming from the parameter passed into the get post method. One more thing I'll call out is that the return type, instead of it being a raw object, is actually wrapped in something called a call. And that is critical to how we'll be doing asynchronous programming um, and avoiding work on the main thread. And so the power of retrofit is really comes down to this, which is that you can take this interface definition and now all the work for turning that into an actual API request will be done for you by retrofit. So that'll turn into get slash post slash four with HTTP 1.1 and the host is you know, this URL that I used for demo, um, jsonplaceholder.typeycode.com. Right? And I'll show you actually how you can um, view exactly what the request and response is using Android Studio in a little bit. But this is what Retrofit will do all the work for you in translating. So now I think we're finally at a happy, happy spot. And if you look at all Android apps, the vast majority are going to be using Retrofit as a networking layer. So it really does show you that you know um, Retrofit is being uh, 
it is saving the developer, me and you, a lot of work, and it's doing it in a really efficient way, So which is why it's gained so much popularity. So if you look at the definition of retrofit, it's a type safe HTTP client for Android and Java, which if you're like me, it took me a little bit of time to understand what that actually meant. I didn't quite understand it. So the way I think about it or the way I explain it is that retrofit is an abstraction to retrieve or send data with the web API. So basically, retrofit makes networking really simple in our Android app. Number one, it handles type conversion. Um, and number two, we're able to use annotations to specify parameters and HTTP methods. So that first one handles type conversion. That's what we're talking about when we say that retrofit is a type safe HTTP client. So that's what it means because retrofit will use some data converter in order to do that conversion. Um, and the annotations are how you specify, you know, are you making a get request, a post request, and so on. And then the definition, even now it says, you know, it's a type safe HTTP client for Android and Java. But in fact, Retrofit has really good support for Kotlin, which is what this talk is primarily about. Um, and there are some Kotlin specific features, in particular coroutines, which are inbuilt into Retrofit. So I imagine that most of you have worked with Retrofit in some capacity. And one of the things you'll notice about Retrofit is that it's declarative, right? So you define this interface and you're basically declaring, okay, I would like to be able to make a GET request on this endpoint and we'll have these particular parameters, right? Um, and, and so I think the, the benefit of Retrofit is that that top portion, that top code snippet that I showed you, it's actually fairly easy to ramp up on and fairly easy to make modifications to. So, but what I wanna spend more time on is actually that bottom, this bottom portion here, which is how do we actually create retrofit and how do we configure it? So here's the example from the demo project that I built. Um, we're using a lazy delegate here, which basically means that we don't need to <clears throat> create retrofit until we actually need it in our application. And then we call the retrofit builder, we pass in a base URL, add in a converter factory, which we'll talk about what that means. We call dot build and then, um, at the bottom, we are actually creating our API. So we use retrofit.create and we pass in the interface definition. And now retrofit will automatically create the, the implementation class that we had earlier. It'll be done for us and we can start calling these methods, get post and get author. And so I think a lot of developers in my experience don't have as much experience with actually looking underneath the hood and seeing what's happening with the retrofit builder and how can we configure it. And that's what I wanna spend most of the time today talking about. Okay, so there are three parts to it that, that I would like to cover. Number one, what are data converters? Uh, number two, what is OKHTTP okay and why do we need it? And we, we talked, we, we touched on OKHTTP okay very briefly earlier on, but I wanna dive deeper in there. And then finally, I wanna talk about coroutines and how using coroutines is the kind of recommended way to use retrofit in Kotlin and how it'll make your life quite a bit easier. So first off, what are data converters? Um, they are the thing that sits in the middle between your client data model and your server data model. They convert whatever your API is returning into objects that our application can actually use. So you can kind of think of it as this bridge go between between client and server. So for example, if your server is returning JSON data um, representing a post, that conversion of deserializing that and turning it into a post data class will happen for us with the data converter and vice versa. So if we have, um, if we would like to be able to send a post and update it on the server, then we need to actually deserialize it. And again, um, we need to serialize it. And that's where data converter will, will do that for us. And so the way this will work is when we create retrofit, we're gonna add this line, add converter factory, Moshi converter factory dot create. And so Moshi is one example of a data converter that you can use with retrofit. And so now we're starting to really understand what's inside of retrofit, right? We have a component here called a data converter and every retrofit implementation must have a data converter in it in order to be usable. There's a couple of different options. If you look at the retrofit documenta documentation, there's actually built-in support for, I think, seven or eight different types of data converters. Moshi, JSON, Jackson, Protobuf, these are the mo most popular ones. Um, and if you're using, if you have a new project 
or if you have a Kotlin project, I really highly recommend starting with Moshi. Jesse Wilson, who's one of the primary authors um, of Moshi um, and JSON, he contributed a bunch to JSON. He, he, he wrote this. Um, I think Moshi fixes some of the things that were problematic with JSON. Um, and it has some built-in niceties specific to Kotlin. So definitely if you are trying to pick between the two, try using Moshi if, if at all possible. Um, like, I think the idea here was that there was an attempt to upgrade JSON to like a 3.0, like the, a major version update, but JSON is so uh, widespread and, and so ingrained in many different projects that it was easier just to create a fork. And that was what Moshi turned into. Um, so Moshi is kind of the recommended way to, to, to do data conversion. So the idea with Moshi is that you can take this JSON representation of a blog post and then turn that into a data class. And the magical thing here is that this will happen for you automatically based on the return type of the interface definition that you, that you wrote. So we have that get post method and it'll return a post object. So um, Moshi will automatically look at the JSON data that's returned from the response body and turn that into a post. One of the things to keep in mind here is that um, you know, the attribute name must exactly match the JSON field name. And if you would like to change that, so for example, here, I wanted to call the body field in, in the JSON, I wanted to call it content in my Kotlin code, in my Android code, just because I thought that was more readable. So then you can annotate with the JSON annotation, what the name is in the JSON and what you want to convert that to in Colin in the data class. And the powerful thing about this is that you can actually customize your data converter. So here, what, what you can see is I have moshi.builder and we're adding a date converter. So we have this inbuilt class called RFC 3339 date, JSON adapter. Um, and what that'll do is it'll take the standardized format of how to represent a, uh, a date. Like it'll be year, month, day, followed by the timestamp, and it'll convert that into a Java date class. And this is important because um, JSON actually has an issue with how it handles time zones with, with dates. So Moshi makes it ex explicit that here's what the date JSON adapter should be. And then finally, we also have this Kotlin JSON adapter factory, which allows us to do the translation between the JSON and Kotlin data classes using reflection. And so now with this customized version of Moshi, we can go into the retrofit builder and then add Moshi as the parameter to the dot create method in the converter factory. So this is, I, I hope, starting to show you some of the power that comes with retrofit, which is that you can really start to plug and play. So any kind of modifications or customizations that you need to make inside of retrofit, you can do this um, very easily using the builder pattern in retrofit. And we can actually go one step further. So this is an example that I took from Jake Wharton and a talk that he gave uh, a few years ago, but there are some issues, like sometimes your server might have quirks or issues that you need to handle in your application. So one example is that sometimes a Ruby server might return zero bytes as the result of an API call, like basically empty, right? And so um, the empty bytes, like zero bytes is actually not valid JSON, right? Um, and so in order to handle that, you, one, op, one approach is every time you make a network request, you kind of check for that error and then you catch it and you do something with it. But the other more clean approach is what we're doing here. So we actually will create one more converter called empty to null converter. We're extending the converter.factory and we're gonna override, this is an abstract class. And so we're gonna override response body converter. And so what we're gonna do inside of here is we are going to check if the response body, if the length of that is zero. And in that case, this means the server is giving us a malformed response and we wanna go ahead and return null right away. If not, then we can go ahead and call the next data converter. And that'll be the Moshi converter, which will do its attempt to translate the JSON into a data class. And so now what we can do when we create retrofit is we'll add one more converter factory. So the add converter factory, empty to null converter. And then after that, we'll call the Moshi converter factory dot create with the Moshi configuration. So the important thing to keep in mind here is that the order does matter. So if I go back, um, the first thing we'll check is empty to null converter. And if that one fails, or if, if that one doesn't return early, then we'll go on and delegate whatever we have to the next converter factory. So you have to keep in mind that if you switch the order here, that would actually lead to 
um, empty to null converter never being run because most you converter factory will always attempt to, to translate the response body. So with converters, um, the idea here is, again, we're turning the byte representation of the data that we get over the wire and we're turning it into a model representation. And the really powerful thing is that you can tweak the behavior of these converters and you can actually add multiple converters. And keep in mind that the order does matter. So the next part of retrofit that people I think may not realize that they can configure or they can change is okay HTTP. So retrofit doesn't actually do the work of issuing or making a, network, a, a HTTP request. By default, all of that work will be delegated to okay HTTP. And I think unless you have a really good reason, you should probably stick with okay HTTP um, because it's optimized for mobile and Android. Um, and so this is the next part of the black box inside of retrofit. So we already talked about the data, we already talked about the data converter. The next part, which um, you can experiment with and play around with, is the HTTP client. And the way this works is we again go back to the retrofit builder, and by default, it's already using OK HTTP. So what we have for here, which is what I showed you earlier, this is exactly equivalent to adding one more line called dot client, and we set the client to be the OK HTTP client. So these are exactly equivalent. And of course, the power here is that now if we wanted to customize the client, then we, were, we would be able to do that. So let me show you what that looks like. A really common use case for why you'd want to be able to, um, to customize the HTTP client is to be able to intercept the outgoing request and add a header. So what we're doing here is we're saying, um, on the builder, add an interceptor on the OK HTTP client called header interceptor. And then now when we create retrofit, we have passed in this new client that we just have, that we just defined. So what is header interceptor? So we're gonna inherit from interceptor, which is a base class, and we're overriding one function here. And all we're doing here is we're looking at the request being made, adding a header, and then putting it back in the queue. So there's actually nothing really that special happening, except for the fact that now every outgoing request will have this modification of a header called user agent with the value of blog explorer sample. This could be really useful for any kind of analytics that you want to do on the server, or a very common pattern is to add any kind of authentication or access token here. So many of the endpoints that you have in your API might be restricted to only being for authenticated users, right? And so here you can pass in the current user, if there is one, what is their access token and, and add that as a header. And then I'll just, I'll just mention here quickly also, if you don't wanna do it on every request, this is gonna be modifying every single outgoing request. If you wanna add a header only on a specific um, endpoint or a specific request, there's also a header annotation that you can add on top of the, you know, like if you're doing a get request, you can add a at get and at header to be able to modify that particular request. So now we can really start to see the kind of mix and match of power of retrofit. So we have by default inside of retrofit, the HTTP client and the data converter, and you're able to customize whatever you pick and choose. And that makes it really customizable um, and easy to work with. And then one thing I wanna call out here is that um, when I first started Android, I don't think the profiler tab existed, or if it did, it existed in a very rudimentary form. But when I, when I was building out the demo for the project here, um, the profiler tab is a really, really nice way to get insight about what exactly is the networking layer of your application doing. So really try to understand the changes that you're making in the configuration of retrofit and how that actually impacts the outgoing request or the response that we get back. I really would recommend opening up the profiler and there's a section here for the network. So if you open that up, then you'll come into a panel like this where you can actually see each connection or each request being made. And then over on the right side here, you can see the overview, response, request, and call stack. And so if we zoom in on that, here is um, the request being made. And you can see that because of the change we made with the custom OK HTTP client, which adds in that header, you can see exactly that that's being shown here. Um, and this is, uh, we're also adding in a body, a JSON body to the 
request here. This is a put request where we're modifying a blog post. That's what you can also validate really easily using the network tab. Um, you know, what's actually happening with the network request. Like here's one more example, the re response tab, you can see all the headers that the server is sending back to you along with what exactly is the JSON body you get. So if you have an issue with somehow a field that you have in your data class isn't being populated, I would really op recommend opening up the network tab and trying to understand what exactly does the JSON look like and where is that conversion going wrong? All right, and then finally, I wanted to talk about coroutines in Kotlin and how Retrofit has a really nice support for coroutines and how it'll make your life quite a bit easier. So first off, just setting some context here. Um, whenever you have an Android app, that'll run as a single process on the Android OS, right? And within that process, you're gonna have multiple threads, right? Android apps are multi-threaded. So you're gonna, you're gonna have one special thread called the main thread or the UI thread. Those are used synonymously. And also you're gonna have a bunch of background threads. And so the, the reason why the main thread is important is because that is where the Android operating system will attempt to draw your application at 60 times per second. Assuming you have a 60 Hertz phone, that means that your application will be redrawn 60 times per second. So that means every 16 milliseconds, we're gonna have one draw call to your application. And that means any of the work that you're doing should happen within 16 milliseconds in order to maintain that really smooth feel of your application UI. So the hard part is that whenever we have a really expensive operation, for example, networking, which is what we're talking about here, that work has to happen on a background thread. So when you first open up your app, that work will happen on the UI thread to show the UI. Then we're gonna fire off a network request. That network request has to happen on a background thread. And so the complexity here becomes we need to take that result from the background thread and then send that back to the UI thread in order to actually update the UI, right? We can't update the UI from a background. And so that coordination or that communication between threads is what coroutines is trying to fix or trying to improve for us. And, and here, let me explain the problem a bit more. What we'd like to be able to do is say something like, hey, val result is equal to do API request, right? But of course, if you've been doing Android for any amount of time, this you'll know this doesn't work. This will actually give you a network on main thread exception because do API request is firing off some network request and um, that'll hold up the UI thread and it'll make your app unresponsive. So Android by default won't allow you to do this. So the solution is callbacks, right? If you've, if you've written Java code, this is definitely what you're gonna have to do um, where we pass in a function as a parameter. And that function that we pass in, that'll get invoked automatically when the expensive operation is complete. And so here's what that looks like. Um, instead of capturing the return value of do API request, that will instead be void. And we say do API request, we pass in object, this is an anonymous class, and we have a function here called on success. So this on success will be invoked for us automatically when the API request is done. And then we can update the UI um, with whatever result we get. So the important thing here is that on success will run on the UI thread. So that management of threads that hap that's happening, we handle that by doing this callback style. And so coming back to retrofit, by default, when we create the retrofit instance, like what we have now, the return type is wrapped inside of a call. And that means that when we actually want to use the, the underlying object, which is what you really care about for showing in the UI, for example, what we have to do is call dot NQ. So here we have like blog API dot get post with the post ID and we NQ a, a callback. And in the callback, of course, you have on failure in case the network request failed, or if it succeeded, we get on response. And then we check, you know, within that, is the response successful? For example, if we got a 404, we'll fall into that if, if branch, um, or we'll fall into the else branch. And then we can do whatever we want to do on the UI thread here. And so this is where coroutines come in. So rather than having this kind of repetitive and verbose um, callback style, we can instead use coroutines and um, combine the power of synchronous code with the power of asynchronous code. 
And the really nice thing is that Retrofit has built in support for coroutines. So you don't actually have to think or worry too much about how to integrate this. This will be done for you. And it's actually very, very simple. All you do is in your API definition, you'll add this suspend keyword. And what you'll also notice is that now um, the return type won't be a call of post. You can actually just unwrap that and simply get back a post, like the actual data class that you care about. Um, and, and let me just also spend one minute here talking about mentally how I think about a coroutine. A coroutine is like a lightweight thread, right? So you have multiple coroutines inside of one thread. And a coroutine has the ability to call the suspend keyword that I just showed you. It'll, it has the ability to call a suspending function. So that's how you're able to bridge the gap between the world of normal functions and suspending functions. You first create a coroutine. And then once you have uh, a coroutine, you can sequentially chain different um, tasks or different suspending functions. And that will allow us to get rid of all the boilerplate around um, callbacks. And the last thing I'll note here is that there's a concept of a dispatcher with coroutines, right? And there are three dispatchers. The first one is called the main dispatcher, and that's used for doing UI related work. So um, it actually, all the work on the main dispatcher happens on the main thread, which is why it's called the main dispatcher. So the only work you should do here are things like um, updating the UI or updating live data. The other two dispatchers, one is called default, and that's for CPU intensive work. So for example, if you're sorting a large list of numbers or if you're using diff utils to like figure out what, what changed between uh, two lists of data, then you can use a default dispatcher. And then finally, the one that we care about is the IO dispatcher, right? IO means input output, Anything with disk or network access, that is going to happen. That should happen on the I/O dispatcher. So now the question is, okay, how do we tell Retrofit to make sure that it should only be using an I/O dispatcher and not the main dispatcher? And the answer is, you don't. Retrofit takes care of all that complexity for us. So there's a concept here called main safety, and what that means is that a a, a library which is main safe means that it's safe to call the suspend function from dispatchers.main, from the main dispatcher, and all the work of switching to the correct dispatcher will be done for us inside the library. And so this is the magic of, um, of main safety and coroutines, is that in your view model, which is where you know probably a lot of the business logic for your application will live, you can launch a coroutine by using the view model scope. So you say view model scope dot launch, and within here, um, the important line is api.getPost. And that's actually doing a network request. But the magical thing here is that we're immediately getting back the fetched post object. There's no need to use the callback. Um, and then we can update the live data and then set the loading to be false. But this is so much easier to work with compared to the callback style, especially because um, if you have nested API requests where you have one API request and the result of that is needed in order to fire off a second API request. You can do that very easily with this style compared to having a lot of nested callbacks um, using the older approach. And then one more thing I wanted to call out here is that um, you know, if you look at the code snippet here, then it feels almost to, it, it's a little scary that we're getting back the actual post object immediately. Um, so then the question becomes, how do we do error handling? What if there's some malformed data in the request? Or what if uh, you know, the, we get a 404 or 500 response from the server? Then this seems a little bit scary. And so one approach is just to do a try catch, which means anything that happens, then we can catch that and then um, show some warning or error in the UI. The other approach, if you want more control, similar to what we had with the call object, you can um, instead of returning a post object directly, you return a response of post. So now we're able to do things which uh, you might be more familiar with from the older style, where you check the is successful attribute of the post response, you can check the code um, and so on. So this, is, this might be more familiar um, if you're coming from the Java world. So kind of wrapping up here, Retrofit is by far the most popular Android library to embed networking in the app. And I think a lot of people get 
spend most of their time looking at the interface definition. So what I'm hoping you took away from the talk here is that there's a lot of power that you can unlock by looking a little bit deeper at the configuration retrofit and customizing the data converter or the HTTP client. So retrofit makes it really easy and simple to convert um, an API, a RESTful API and the HTTP methods into methods that we can actually execute in our app. And this works in both Java and Kotlin. And, and yeah, like I just mentioned, um, with Retrofit, we can easily plug and play different components, right? So if you want to modify um, a particular data converter or um, the HTTP client, you can do that. And the benefit is that now you don't need to actually have that logic be spread across in the app layer. All the messiness is actually done, um, is taken care of by Retrofit just by doing the configuration appropriately. Okay, and then one thing I just wanted to mention here, this talk was much more, I would say theoretical about how Retrofit configuration works. If you want a more hands-on like tutorial on how to use Retrofit, I actually made a LinkedIn learning course. So um, feel free to DM me and I can, I can share the link for that with you. Um, but that'll actually go through the specifics of how to you know, actually be able to build an app using Retrofit with Kotlin. So with that, um, that's all I had. I uh, would love to connect with you, hear any feedback on the talk, or if you have any questions, um, happy to do that. And then, like, like I said earlier, I'm pretty active on Twitter, YouTube, and, and LinkedIn. So feel free to pick whatever platform and would love to connect. Thanks a lot. Awesome, thank you, sir. We do have a few minutes if anyone wants to throw in a question. Uh, remember the Slack channel for this is what you didn't know about retrofit with Kotlin. So don't be shy. If you've got a question or something you want to discuss for the next few minutes before we take a short break uh, between for our next talk. Let's see if anyone throws one in for a second here. That was great, sir. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Let's see. Nav might have a question. I love that Slack lets us like preemptively know if someone is doing yeah. something. And then we wait in anticipation. Um, question from uh, the Zoom chat. Uh, Hitham, oh. would, would you prefer coroutines or Rx Java? I definitely would prefer coroutine. So actually, I might be a little bit unique here because I never actually spent too much time doing Rx Java. So I, I can't really, I don't have a great way of comparing them. But like from all the blog posts I've read and in my experience is that coroutines is definitely the path forward in terms of it's being pushed pretty heavily by the Kotlin team and Android team. Um, so any kind of, uh, anything with like asynchronous logic, I definitely would prefer coroutines over Rx. Nice, and we got, one more real quick one. Uh, have you explored the KTOR for Android? Uh, a great question. I have not actually done like a demo app or anything with KTOR, but I, I've, I've heard a lot. And I think um, KTOR is actively being developed by some of the folks over, over I think at JetBrains who, who came out with it, but I haven't actually played around with it. I'd love to, if you have any feedback on that or thoughts on that, I'd love to learn from you as well. Mm -hmm.